Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Let me start too by thanking the organizers for this uh, enjoyable conference on a figure that I don't get to hear about or talk about very often. It's good. Um, let me start with a little story. So um, my wife and I recently bought a house. And when you buy houses, there's lots of things to repair. One of the things I did this summer was rebuild the porch. And then we had a long discussion about what color to paint the porch ceiling. Um, there's a tradition in the American South of painting it light blue. We were sort of partial to light green. Eventually, we decided to paint it light green. But we had a long discussion about exactly what color to use. Here's what we did not discuss. We had no discussion at all about numerically which instance of the same green to paint the house. That was not something we spent any time on. And I suspect my wife would not have been impressed if I had raised the question. <laughs> but on certain views of individuation, that's not a ridiculous question to raise. So suppose you deny Leibniz's law of the identity of indiscernibles and think that there are, in fact, many possible numerically distinct but indiscernible instances of green ceilings. One of them became actualized at our house. But why that one rather than a different one? What made it the case that this effect was produced rather than a numerically different effect? This issue of individuation received pretty serious attention from early modern scholastics. The view that became associated with the Jesuits is that creatures don't, in fact, determine wi numerically which instance gets produced, but God determines that. So my aim in this paper is to look briefly at one of the sources of the discussion, though by no means the only one, in Francisco Suarez, and then turn to the more extensive discussion in Hurtado, and then finally touch a little bit on some of the legacy. So as is well known, Suarez is a concurrentist, and he raises a bunch of arguments for the view that um, God concurs to produce the effects that creatures also take part in. And I think, uh, by my count, he has six different arguments for concurrentism. The fifth argument has received very little scholarly attention, but that's the one that I want to look at now. And that's the one that concerns individuation of effects. Now, Suarez indicates some hesitation whenever he talks about the individuation of effects. And as a matter of fact, he changed his mind on the subject. So if you look at his earlier uh, commentary on the third part of Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, um, he dismisses the view that God individuates effects as a unphilosophical view. But by the time he writes his metaphysical disputations, um, he, see, he reports that he has considered the matter more carefully, and now he thinks that the individuation of effects should, in fact, be attributed to God. As a result, he deems the following argument for concurrentism as very probable, and this is text one on the handout. A fifth argument is very probable. For a secondary cause is unable to determine itself to an effect as it is an individual and particular effect, since its power is always indifferent with respect to multiple individuals and is not sufficiently determined by the subject and the circumstances. Therefore, the cooperation of the first cause is necessary, who by his will is able to determine that power to a singular effect. All right, so the truth of the premises may not be entirely obvious, but the general tenor of the argument is straightforward enough. And I've uh, presented a formalization of it on uh, number two on the handout. Secondary causes are indifferent with respect to multiple indiscernible but numerically distinct effects. Crucial premise. Second premise, secondary causes are not able to determine themselves to one of two or more effects that are, uh, to which they are indifferent. Therefore, no secondary cause, i.e. no created cause, is able to determine itself to numerically one effect. But every cause, that is a cause in second act, is determined to numerically one effect. Therefore, that determination must be provided by a non-created thing, i.e. God. If God numerically determines every effect, then God directly causally contributes to every effect. Therefore, God must directly causally contribute to every effect. And that's basically your concurrentist conclusion. Notice, by the way, that one of the primary arguments in favor of mere conservationism as opposed to concurrentism relies on the premise that secondary causes have sufficient power to bring about effects. That's one premise. Second premise, God doesn't act superfluously. Therefore, he doesn't concur with all the act actions of creatures. The argument for concurrentism from Suarez that I just presented, of course, amounts to a denial of the first premise of that argument. Secondary causes, in fact, are not sufficient to produce their effects. Why not? 
because they cannot determine that numerically this effect be produced rather than some other effect, that this form be adduced from matter rather than an indiscernible but numerically distinct form. Now Suarez spends fairly little time in explicating this rather curious argument, but it's pretty clear that the first premise relies on his account of individuation. So in the fifth disputation, when he raises the issue of the individuation of effects, he's in the process of discussing the Thomistic view that the principle of individuation is designated matter. And under that view, you might think there's a ready story to tell about how the effects are going to be individuated. An effect is going to be the particular effect it is in virtue of that out of which it is produced. A fire may not determine that this heat rather than that heat be produced in a pot of water, but that determination is ensured by the matter in which the heat is produced. So my wife and I didn't pick a species, uh, did not pick a species of green for our porch seeding and the matter determined our numerical instance of green, rather the matter, um, well on the Thomistic view the matter would, but Suarez reject, rejects that. Suarez thinks no, the matter doesn't do that individuation. He rejects the designated matter account of individuation. His own view is more similar to Occam's view than to the Thomistic one. His view is that every individual thing is individual in itself or through the principles that constitute it if it is a composite. So I have a text here, number three on the handout. Every singular substance is singular in itself or through its entity and it does not need any other principle of individuation beyond its own entity or beyond the intrinsic principles that constitute its entity. And that view, I take it, opens the door to the possibility of multiple indiscernible effects, each numerically individual through its own entity, but in no way discernible from the others. A possibility that Suarez explicitly accepts. But now an obvious question arises. What determines which of these indiscernible effects is produced in an instance of causation? And Suarez then claims that secondary causes can't determine the numerical individual because plausibly enough, they're indifferent with respect to indiscernible effects. So in short, multiple indiscernible effects, secondary causes aren't able to determine themselves to these because they're indifferent to them, therefore God has to step in and provide the determination. Now, a, whole, a variety of questions could be raised about this account, about as what Suarez says in particular, I'm going to set those aside for the moment and move on to Hurtado's account. So while Suarez's view has to be woven together from brief discussions inserted in a bunch of different disputations, Hurtado devotes a section directly to this question of God's individuation of effects. The section also comes in a broader discussion of concurrentism, so the broad context is the same one. Now, Hurtado's initial response to the argument that we just saw in Suarez hardly counts as an endorsement. So disputation 10 of the physics part um, concerns the first cause. In the second section, Hurtado considers the question whether the first cause um, concurs with all creaturely actions, so that's the concurrentism question. He starts with a quick summary of standard arguments for concurrentism and raises problems for them. The ninth argument is the one that we just saw in Suarez namely that God, ha God has to concur with all actions in order to determine effects numerically. And that Hurtado's response is, uh, many doctors endorse other principles of individuation. A general feature of his discussion of concurrentism is that he's skeptical of how decisive the philosophical arguments for concurrentism are. He ends the second section of Disputation 10 by stating that he agrees with the more common view among the scholastics, that is concurrentism, not because it has been clearly demonstrated, but because the greater number of theologians have agreed with it since the beginning. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, a few sections later in section four, when Hurtado focuses on the individuation of effects, he appears more convinced of the crucial premise in the individuation argument for concurrentism. In fact, he ends up dismissing the arguments for the opposing view as absurd. One of Hurtado's sources is clearly Suarez. He takes great pains, however, to cite a whole range of predecessors holding this view. The reason is because he's trying to undercut a claim made by the other father of Jesuit philosophy, Gabriel Vasquez. 
Vasquez objects to this individuation argument and characterizes it, characterizes it repeatedly as a new method of philosophizing, it should be rejected. So Hurtado begins by enlisting the support of Gregory of Remini, Juan de Salas, Francisco Toledo, the Coimbra commentaries, and various other people. And then after he's listed a whole long uh, list of people who held this view, he then says it's really surprising that Vasquez would have thought this was a new way of philosophizing. Uh, so that's quotation four on the handout. So it's presumably because Hurtado wants to emphasize that the view is not new that he includes Gregory in his list because it's actually not entirely clear, clear that Gregory really held the exact view that he's talking about. Um, but that's a way of getting the history to go back a little bit further. All the other people he cited were actually quite recent and might not adequately show that this is not a new way of philosophizing. Anyway, after he presents this list of people, uh, Hurtado endorses the view. As he explains it, created causes tend to some kinds of effects rather than others, but they are indifferent with respect to numerically different instances of the same kind of effect. Fire, for example, has a power to heat rather than a power to cool. Um, in a given set of circumstances, it will have the power to heat the patient to a certain degree rather than to a different degree. So all of that is within the nature of the fire. But as far as numerically different heatings to the same degree are concerned, the fire is indifferent. No more disposed to one instance of heating than another. And then the selection of one effect rather than another indiscernible effect is left to God's will. When God wills to concur with numerically this effect rather than another one, the fire's indifference is overcome and it causally contributes to that effect. That is quotation number five on the handout, except I noticed something really strange happened and we have a whole bunch of number fours on the handout. Um, so I'll leave you to figure out uh, how to keep counting. I, I take it everybody here can count to eight. Um, but the last one on the first page should be number five. Hurtado spends a lot more time responding to objections than offering positive arguments for this view. And his arguments for the view don't add a great deal to what's already present in his explication of the view. The several arguments that he offers are basically variations of the same core argument. So taking up the fire example again, he argues that there is nothing created that determines it to one instance of heating rather than another. Then he talks about prime matter and says it's indifferent to different forms talks about the rational soul, says it's indifferent to different bodies. Free will is a little bit more of a complicated case, but he says it remains free to love or hate an object once the object has been presented to it. It can also love or hate with different degrees of intensity, but he says it doesn't have the power to prefer one, numerically one instance of love to an indiscernible different instance of love. So the core argument in all of those cases, I take it is the same one that we saw in Suarez above. Secondary causes are indifferent with respect to indiscernible effects and hence can't determine themselves to one rather than the other. Consequently, that determination is left up to God. Now, Hurtado does spend some time ruling out several alternative sources of determination. So he thinks that the power of a created cause such as fire is open to multiple different effects, different heatings in the case of fire, is shown by the fact that the cause can successively produce multiple instances of the effect. And then he thinks all the effects that a uh, cause can produce successively are already contained in that cause's power. And so that's part of the explanation for why fire is indifferent to a bunch of numerically distinct uh, effects. And then he says, look, the same thing is going to be true on the side of the patient. So that's also not going to be a source of individuating or determining the effect to numerically one instance rather than another. Because the patient could also be successively heated by different instances of heat. Hurtado also rejects the suggestion that place or time determine which effects are produced. And here he does so on grounds that neither place nor time are actually operative causes. And also because place and time don't as a general matter, individuate things. For example, numerically different heatings can exist in the same place and numerically the same thing can exist through different times. And so he thinks just as a general rule, we don't get individuation by time or place. So we shouldn't think that that happens here either. <coughs> 
And then he seems to assume that those are the relevant candidates. Agent, patient, time, place, those are the relevant candidates on the created side of things that might individuate effects. And since he has now argued that none of them do, we can conclude, quotation number six, that there is nothing created that determines secondary causes to numerically this action. I described Hurtado's argument as being the same as Suarez's argument and said that Suarez's argument rests on a certain account of individuation. Hurtado's argument throughout certainly assumes that there can in fact be numerically distinct but indiscernible effects. If indiscernible effects were always were numerically identical, then this issue would never arise. Um, so, th so to that extent, Hurtado's argument for the conclusion that God must individuate effects um, assumes a controversial claim about individuation. Uh, this threatens to be slightly awkward for Hurtado since when he argues for his account of individuation, he actually appeals explicitly to what he said about the individuation of effects. That doesn't happen in Suarez. So in Suarez, you can pretty straightforwardly say, look, we first get an argument about individuation. That raises a problem. Now we have a question about the individuation of effects. In Hurtado, I think there's at least the prima facie circularity worry. Um, that the account of individuation r relies on what he said about the account of individuation of effects, um, but that latter thing seems to be motivated by already having a certain view about individuation. I'm not going to thoroughly pursue that matter now, but there's at least an initial worry of that sort. So as I said earlier, Hurtado spends most of his time responding to a variety of objections. I'm going to present four of the key ones though three of them, I think, rely on the same basic response. And I'm not going to follow Hurtado's order. One difference that I noticed in reading Suarez and in reading Hurtado, at least on this particular issue, is that um, Suarez seems more carefully systematic in his presentation. Uh, with Hurtado, I found the order of things confusing. You get a couple of objections, and then you get an argument for, and some more objections, and anyway. Um, so I'm not going to follow his order because of that. One objection is that indifference to infinite effects requires infinite power. So the assumption in the background there seems to be that if there are in fact numerically distinct indiscernible effects, then there's going to be an infinite number of them. And then the claim is a created cause that is indifferent between indiscernible effects may reason reasonably be assumed then to be indifferent to infinitely many effects, but that's going to require the power to produce infinitely many effects since effects that aren't in a cause's power are clearly not ones that it's going to be indifferent to. S but created causes only have finite power. They do not have the power to produce infinite effects. Therefore, says the objector, it cannot be the case that created causes are indifferent to effects merely numerically distinct. In response, Hurtado explains that the cru crucial claim should be read divisively rather than collectively. That is, a created cause is indifferent to which one of the infinite effects it produces, but it is not indifferent to producing more than one of them. Indifference to infinitely many effects divisively does not require infinite power. Hurtado offers a helpful example. If there were an infinite number of horses before me, I could ride any one of them. But that does not mean that I could ride two horses at once, and it certainly doesn't mean that I could ride infinitely many horses at once. <laughs> As he puts it, being able to produce about a thousand effects at the same time is very different from being able to affect any one effect out of a thousand. That seems undoubtedly right. That would be quotation number seven. And it's the latter sort of thing that Hurtado is claiming for created causes, and he thinks this doesn't require infinite power. Strikes me as a pretty good response to that objection. A second objection is based on the observation that selecting an individual is thereby to select the species since the species is contained in the individual. If I go to a pet store and I decide to buy Rover, I have thereby decided to buy a dog since Rover is a dog. Just like I have thereby decided to buy something that's an animal, I have thereby decided to buy something that's um, a living thing and so on. 
Hence, if God decides which individual effect is to be produced, then God also decides which species of effect is to be produced. But, the objection continues, secondary causes were supposed to determine the species. For example, that my hand is warmed when I put it close to a fire rather than being cooled is because fire has the, such a nature that it heats things. It's supposed to be fire that determines that heating occurs, not God selecting a particular individual effect. The concurrent is, by the way, will add that God concurs with this heating, but that God's concurrence is with heating rather than with cooling because God's concurrence accords, at least in ordinary cases, with the nature of the secondary causes. At any rate, since selecting an individual amounts to selecting the species, but since created causes select the species of effects, it can't be the case that God is responsible for the individuation of effects. So the objection goes. There's a third objection that's related to that one. The third objection claims that Hurtado's view will leave God responsible for sin. After all, it is God who selects numerically which actions are performed. So take Judas's betrayal of Christ. On the view Suarez and Hurtado are defending, God selected the individual betrayal that took place. In fact, there is a sense in which it seems that Judas performed the very action he performed because God willed it. But God cannot be responsible for sin. So if indi attributing individuation to God requires attributing sin to God, the objector says, then we should reconsider attributing individuation to God. There's a fourth objection that's also closely related to this one. According to this objection, God selecting individual effects is going to damage free will. The claim is that free causes such as human beings should be free not only with respect to exercise and specification, but also with respect to individuation. Not only should I be free to love or not love, um, and free to love or hate to a certain degree, I should be also be able to free to love with numerically this love rather than a different love. All right, so the first step, I think, to addressing these last three objections is to see how there can be room for the secondary cause to specify the effect even without individuating it. For the view of Suarez and Hurtado to work, some way has to be found for the secondary cause and first cause to concur in such a way that the specifying role is left to the secondary cause, but the individuating role is left to the first cause. And I take the basic solution to be to see God's concurrence as conditional. And I don't think that solution is entirely ad hoc, since concurrentists already have other reasons for thinking that God's concurrence is conditional. For example, to preserve free will. So rather than saying that God selects numerically this effect, we should say that on the condition that the secondary cause be directed at an effect of this species, then God selects this effect, rather than some other effect of that species. But should the secondary cause be directed or choose a, an effect of a different species, then God will select a given instance of that species. For example, take the case of Peter loving Christ. God didn't simply select that individual effect, thereby determining that Peter would love Christ. Rather, God's selection of that effect was conditional on Peter choosing to love Christ. Had Peter chosen to hate Christ, then God would have selected an individual instance of hate rather than of love. So I think that's enough to respond to the first of these last three objections. It's true that the individual contains the species, but making the act of individuation conditional on the act of specification leaves room for the secondary cause to specify the effect, even though God chooses the individual effect. So that, I take it, blocks the objector's inference in what I call the second objection. This also provides space to see how God need not be morally responsible for an individual evil act that is performed or that he selected. Strictly speaking, God does not will that the evil be performed. Rather, God just wills that this evil act come about rather than that one on the assumption that one or another evil act is going to come about. Since the specification of the act is still up to the created agent, e.g. whether to love or to hate an object that ought to be loved, it is still within the created agent's power either to perform a good act or an evil act. <coughs> 
hence it's still the created agent that's praiseworthy or blameworthy for, perform for performing the act. Uh, consider an analogy adapted from an example that Hurtado uses when he's talking about freedom. Suppose I tell my son that he's allowed to use my pencil to write something, but he's not allowed to use my pen. Suppose, furthermore, that he decides to write some malicious rumor about a classmate and hand the note to a different classmate. I prevented him from writing it with my pen, so in some sense, I helped bring it about that there was an act of malicious rumor writing with a pencil. But does that in any way leave me morally culpable for the event? No. It was my son's decision whether or not to write something malicious. That's where the morally salient choice lies. And so even though I, in some sense, contributed to the de determination of the event, I don't thereby share any of the responsibility for the event's badness. The story with respect to free will should be pretty predictable by now. Um, in the first place, the point that a created agent is not free with respect to individuation can simply be conceded. Hurtado, by the way, emphasizes that his opponents actually are going to have the same problem because according to their view, individuation is determined by the circumstances in which the act is performed. So it's still not the agent that's free, it's just the circumstances doing the determination. So he thinks, look, either way, the agent doesn't have the freedom with respect to individuation, so there's no problem in attributing that to God. Secondly, insofar as the objector claims that leaving individuation to God amounts to a reduction of freedom for created agents, Hurtado can just deny that there's any significant reduction here. What's morally significant about choice isn't picking numerically which instance of an effect gets produced, but rather which species of effect gets produced. That's morally salient, that's in our power, so the significant freedom is still in our hands. In summary, if the doctrine is understood properly, there are ways to block the inferences of opponents to these unpalatable conclusions. Hence, since it is hard to see how created agents could pick one rather than another of numerically distinct indiscernible effects, that individuating role should be attributed to God. All right, I want to conclude briefly by saying a little bit about the legacy of this view. Um, I don't know enough about the subsequent text to say anything authoritative, but I want to gesture at least at one suggestive thread, a thread that leads to Leibniz. So this view seems to have become known as the Jesuit view. William Twiss, the very learned scholarly and once well-regarded Calvinist divine in Cromwellian England, discusses the view on several occasions. He primarily refers to Suarez and Hurtado, but he clearly takes this view to be the Jesuit view more generally, though he does incidentally recognize Vasquez's dissent, but he seems to think by and large the Jesuits held this view. Twiss's more detailed discussion of the view comes in his massive rebuttal of Arminianism entitled Vindication of the Grace, Power, and Providence of God, but the view also comes up in his better known attack on middle knowledge. He wrote this approximately 500 page book attacking middle knowledge and this comes up in that volume. And this latter work, the middle knowledge work, is the one that Leibniz was familiar with, as we know from a set of excerpts and notes on the work that Leibniz left. And in these notes, Leibniz explicitly refers to Hurtado and the view under discussion. So at the very least then, we know that Leibniz was aware of Hurtado's view, even if perhaps only via Twiss's work. Now, I don't know of any place where Leibniz gives a critical discussion of this view. Nevertheless, one can imagine how this kind of view must have struck the rationalist Leibniz. We never mind anymore the question whether it's possible for God to arbitrarily choose to actualize one world rather than another world, even if the former world is no better than the second world. On the view espoused by Suarez and Hurtado, God must arbitrarily pick from an infinite array of indiscernible effects ubiquitously. Every time you love something, you put God in the position of having to arbitrarily pick one among an infinite array of indiscernible effects. Presumably such ubiquitous violations of the principle of sufficient reason would have appalled Leibniz. We know that Leibniz occasionally argued for the identity of indiscernibles by appeal to the principle of sufficient reason. 
If there were two indiscernible individuals, then there would be two possible worlds differing only in the two individuals being switched from one world to the next. But then there would be no reason for God to choose one world over the other. And so, the, well, and since the PSR requires that God have a reason, um, we can conclude that our starting assumption is false. That is, we should conclude that there are no indiscernible individuals. As the old saying goes, one person's modus ponens is another's modus tollens. Suarez and Hurtado start from a certain view of individuation. They start from the assumption that you have numerically distinct indiscernibles and then conclude that created causes are indifferent to those indiscernible effects, leaving God to select individual effects arbitrarily. Leibniz would presumably respond by denying that God can arbitrarily pick effects and would from there deny that there are numerically distinct effects. Whose line of argument is the better one is a topic for another day. Thank you. <laughs>